We're here with Ben Roth, producer, director, writer extraordinaire. <laughs> Thank you and, so much. <laughs> uh, you're, you're welcome, Ben. You're welcome. I just, uh, look, I love your work and we have a bit of a history and we'll go into that yeah. in a moment. Uh, let's do this. Let's, first off, uh, I met Ben during, was it, was it your first film? Yeah, yeah, it was my, uh, my first feature, yeah. Yeah, which was uh, entitled uh, Alien Raiders. Alien Raiders, yeah. Film, much better than the title. Thank you. Ben had, nothing, <laughs> ben had nothing to do with that title. That was not my but, choice. <laughs> ben has gone on to some really incredible stuff. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But Ben and I have had the opportunity to work with an incredible gentleman, a Stuart the uh, he was the director of Reanimate. He was also, I believe, producer and uh, on uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. He wrote it. He was he, a, he, done, he, he uh, created he created the uh, idea. He wrote Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. The idea, okay. Yeah. Okay. And tell me, uh, tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about Stu and how you met him. Well, I'd met Stuart a couple of times because I was, you know, a massive, massive fan, obviously, uh, not just from his horror movies in the 80s, which I, you know, Reanimator, From Beyond, Dolls, Castle Freak. Uh, I mean, you, you can go on yeah. and on. Um, uh, I, I, I love his movies. Uh, but also, uh, I'm also a theater nerd in, in addition to being a horror nerd. And so I, uh, I knew that he had created the organic theater in Chicago, which was like, that was where Dennis Franz and Joe Montaigne and lots of, you know, humongous actors, Keith Sarabaka, like a lot of them got their first start uh, in the 60s and early 70s. And I knew a little bit about, um, about the organic theater because uh, I'm from Orlando, Florida. And in Orlando, there was a theater called Theater Downtown, and the guy who ran it, his name was Frank Hilgenberg, and Frank was kind of a protege of Stewart's. Um, and so when I found, I was working on a play, I was like 19, doing special effects makeup on a play for Frank, and I found out that he knew Stewart, or that he'd worked with Stewart, and I was like, tell me more, tell me more. And one of the things he told me was, uh, I was, I was, uh, giant fan of Kurt Vonnegut at the time. I was like reading all of Vonnegut's books. He's like, oh yeah, Stuart did a, an adaptation of the Sirens of Titan, which happened to be my favorite uh, Vonnegut book uh, at the organic in the mid seventies. Um, so uh -huh. fl flash way, 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 way the hell forward. Uh, uh, that was when I was 19, when I was well into my forties, I was an artistic director. I was one of three artistic directors at a small theater in Hollywood called Sacred Fools. And, um, and so part of what you do as an artistic director is you choose the season. And my friend Janelle Riley came up to me and said, I just read this script. You have to read it. We'd already kind of figured our season out. Uh, but she's like, you have to read this. Stuart Gordon wants to direct it. And I was like, done, but I probably can't do it. I probably can't get it in there. And that was uh, a script by a guy named Benjamin Brand called Taste. And it's to this day, one wow. of the best scripts, if not the best, if not the best script, one of the top three scripts I've ever read in my life. Just, just an amazing script with Stuart attached. And I brought it to the other artistic directors and basically made the case and they agreed because it was such a great script. And we were able to produce that play that season. And um, I, uh, I direct a lot of theater, but I asked Stuart if I could be his uh, assistant director. And assistant director in theater is very different than the way it is in film. But that basically meant that I kind of had a front row seat to watch how he put that play together. And, um, and I was also a producer on the play, as was Janelle, who gave me the script. And so I was like all up in the process and I got to work I very- I remember- when... Yeah, when you invited me to yeah. see it, I, I was very hesitant because the idea was so weird and out yeah. there. And at the end of the play, I remember everybody standing up and applauding, standing ovation. It was yeah. amazing. And the power of the actors. It, it was a great testament to Stuart. It really was. It really was. Uh, you know, St Stuart was amazing. And just watching how he staged that play and uh, how he worked with the actors. There's only two actors in the play. It's, it's a very, uh, for, for, for those who are unfamiliar with it, uh, listening to us, it's uh, it's about a guy who puts an ad on the internet for someone who he can murder and eat, and somebody responds to it, 
and the whole play is just the two of them meeting at his apartment uh, that night. So it's just two characters. There is a, 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 a full working kitchen at the center of the play uh, and, and uh, stuff is cooked and eaten on stage. Oh, can you hear me? Am I breaking up? Yeah, you were breaking up and freezing. Um, I'm going to close everything long. on my computer that isn't Zoom. Sometimes it's possibly the, I don't know if it's on your end or my end. My internet's Hold on one second. usually now pretty good. Pardon? Can you hear me? Now it's your visual, Ben. Yeah, now I hear you. Okay, I just quit out of every other app that I was running. And just in case, I'm going to pause, make sure Dropbox isn't syncing anything. Nope, nothing's syncing. Sorry about that, Ray. That's okay. We'll do the best we can. Uh, let's talk about independent filmmaking. Now, we have a lot of independent filmmakers out here that have entered their films and festivals. Uh, you're, you've done that quite a time. Yeah. Ben? Yeah, you froze on me that time. I don't know. Hello? Tracy? Uh, some kind of difficulty here with the Zoom call. I don't know if it's the internet or what. Okay, it says your internet connection is unstable. Okay. Right. Uh huh. Okay. They're telling me that the signal is low. It's going to come in and out. We're using a hot spot. Yeah. That so ben, um. Wow. This is what happens when you when you do Zoom meetings. <laughs> uh. Let's see. Okay. If if you can talk about a little bit about your experience at film festival. Yeah, I, I have a lot of experience with film festivals. I even worked at one for a few years. Uh, I was uh, the projectionist at the Florida Film Festival, which is an amazing festival if you get a chance to ever go uh, in Orlando. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, you know, I've been I've been sending my stuff out to film festivals since I was in college. Um, I uh, have had a, a bit of luck. Probably the project I worked on that had the most festival love was the Blair Witch Project, which got into Sundance. I did not direct that, but I was the production designer and I was one part of the team that that created it. And Sundance, you know, changed the trajectory of that film and the lives of everybody involved with it. Um, I've sent, uh, when, I, when I made Alien Raiders for Warner Brothers, in fact, when they told me that it was going to be entitled Alien Raiders, I asked them if I could do a festival run with it. And I, and I did it at my own expense. Um, but we, we premiered at Fantastic Fest, which is a, an amazing festival. I met you uh, because of that. You were at, uh, it was the Phoenix, uh, it, was the, it was the horror festival at, of part of the Phoenix Film Festival, right? Right, that was the International Horror and Sci-Fi Film Festival in Phoenix. That was it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, was it then part of the Phoenix International Film Festival or did it Yeah, later it, it was, it was, it was yeah. um, but it was its own separate entity at the time and then later they merged. That was a great festival, by the way. That was just a fun festival, really, 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 really well programmed. I, I, I saw a lot of films there. It was, the people there were really nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that was great. Um, you know, but we played Shriek Fest, Shocker Fest. We played, basically, they only gave me about a two or three month window to play. They, uh, the company that made my film was called Raw Feed, and they had a film called Rest Stop 2 that, that came out right, like, in August. So I basically had from September through when our movie came out in January to submit it. But the good news was because it's kind of a horror sci-fi thing, that meant that I could hit all the genre festivals. And I'm a big fan of those. The New York City Horror Film Festival, um, run, which at the time was run by the late uh, Michael Hine, uh, great festival. I, I was, I, I'd had a short there a few years earlier. And I find, I love genre festivals 
uh, just um, as, a, as a film goer and as a filmmaker. Um, as a film goer, obviously I like genre films and it's fun to go, you know, see just a bunch of horror, sci-fi, anime, whatever. Um, and then as a filmmaker, the people who, uh, who go to those festivals are going to be the people who are most excited to see the kind of stuff I keep trying to make. So, um, so, you know, I mean, like I've played at bigger festivals. I had a short a few years ago that got into Tribeca. That was very exciting. Tribeca's, you know, world-class festival. Right. Um, but, and this is not a knock on Tribeca, but I feel like festivals like Tribeca and there's some other festivals, they're huge. And so you have to fight a little more just to be noticed in the sea of all the major stars and all, and all that stuff. Whereas when you're at a genre festival, the people who come, who come see your film are the people who want to see a film like yours. They're very appreciative that you've showed up. And again, as, as a viewer, like, you know, when I went to that one in Phoenix or when I went to Shocker Fest or uh, Shriek Fest or Fantastic Fest, you know, which is, you know, I, in my opinion, the best genre festival, pro probably my favorite film festival I've ever attended, period. Um, you know, Fantastic Fest just had uh, great programming, amazing filmmakers in attendance, amazing fans, great venues. Like, you know, it's just like a week long party with all your best friends watching all these amazing films. I, I think festivals, people in this day and age where you can just stick a movie up on YouTube or Vimeo and anyone on earth can watch it, ask, well, what's the purpose of a festival? And I, I feel like being able to interact with the audience, either as an audience member or a filmmaker is invaluable and you can't really do it any other way. I agree with you wholly. Uh, there is this feeling of when you were, God, I don't want to mention those film, the, those uh, festivals, but some of the bigger festivals, I'll just leave it at that. The real big festivals seem to be just an extension, an arm for the studios who have their own, uh, what is it called? Uh, their, their own arts, art lineup. Yeah. But they're studio, they're still studio films. They're backed by the studio. They have big stars. You know, and it's much harder for a struggling independent to get out there and show their true voice. Yeah. And that's what this festival is all about. Is you know that's great. Giving, yeah, give, giving independent people their chance, and not just not just from California, but all over the world, which is great. So, yeah. And well, we've got we have uh, documentaries, we have features, we have shorts, micro. Have you heard of, this is the first time I've heard of micro shorts. Have you heard of those? I've not heard of, how long is a micro short? A micro short is, a micro short film is under five minutes. Now, can you imagine trying to get your point across in under five I, minutes? I have, I did a web series where like our longest episode well, that's was- right, 20 was, seconds to live. Yeah, right? all of our, okay. most, most of our episodes were about two and a half minutes long. So I should have submitted. Right, let's talk about that a little bit. Tell us about 20 Seconds to Live. Uh, 20 Seconds to Live is uh, one of one of my uh, main partners in crime is a, is a guy named Bob DeRosa. And Bob and I have been working together for years. And uh, at that very same theater, Sacred Fools, he and I did uh, a ton of late night, gross out, whatever, uh, like small shows. Uh, like uh, they, have, they have an ongoing show called Serial Killers where the audience, where uh, it's five one act plays that kind of end with a cliffhanger and the audience votes to bring three back for the next week. So you have a week to write, direct, stage, sound design, light design, everything, uh, a whole other show. And we did that for years, years and years. And, um, and at one point I was like, you know, if we put the same effort into like a film project, you know, we might, we might be onto something. We might have something we could really show around and get some traction out of. And we kind of started talking about making a, like a web series. And, um, the idea of 20 seconds to live is kind of built around keeping it short. And, it, and it's our belief that, I mean, it's not our belief. I think it's just a fact. Attention spans are crazy short online. So if you're going to ask someone to watch a web series, don't ask them to watch a 45 minute uh, web series. And I have seen web series with 45 minute long episodes. Don't ask for that. That's a big ask. Like that better be a scintillating 45 minutes. But we had episodes that were as short as a minute and a half. Um, and you know, the, the basic premise is it's an anthology, which means it's new characters every, every episode. And we right. would have uh, a setup of these new characters in a new situation. And then at a certain point, our title card came up 20 seconds to live. And then the 20 dropped down and became a countdown. So 20 seconds later, someone was going to die. One of the characters you met <laughs> was going to, was going to die. 
And, um, and, and it was just a lot of fun. And we, we, we didn't really challenge ourselves with this, but we kind of noticed that we, uh, sorry, my three-year-old son is about to run in here. Uh, we, uh, we never shot any, we, there are no guns in the whole, in the whole thing. Like it was always a, a little bit more Rube Goldberg-ish. Um, yeah. and, uh, we were able to explore lots of genres. Like, you know, we did one that kind of looks like an emergency room, you know, an ER kind of thing. We did one that's a vampire thing. We did one that was a time travel, straight up science fiction thing. You know, we, we, we kind of, we, we weren't really stuck in any genre and it was a way for us to work with a lot of actors. And we brought in, uh, some of our friends who were like known in the horror world, like Derek Mears, Adam Green, uh, Dan Myrick, uh, Graham Skipper, you know, we, we got some really cool horror, horror buddies uh in there and um it, i don't know it, it was a lot of fun most of the sh most of the episodes shot in, in about a day um and uh, our dp is a guy named george foyt who i've worked with for years and like we wanted them to look like television we, we put a lot of work into making them look and sound and feel like they had a much bigger budget than they had because they had like not almost no budget well let me ask this um how how do people can people still see this Oh yeah. If you go to 20 seconds to live.com or okay. 20, 20 STL.com, they're all online. Great. Also on Facebook where we have a Facebook group and they're all there too. Okay. And uh, do you have anything else you, you want to plug? Uh, well, uh, and uh, another thing that I, I did with Bob, actually, I would love to plug, which was a podcast. So maybe not uh, perfect for a film festival, but it used a lot of our film skills, our filmmaking skills. It's called video palace. And it's a horror fiction podcast that Bob and I co-wrote based on a concept from uh, that my friend Mike Manello and Nick Brockia had come up with, and uh, and stars Chase Williamson from John Dies at the End, um, and uh, and and uh, Devin Sedell, who's she was in Thirty One. She, she, uh, she uh, she's been in a million things. She's an amazing actor, and um, and it's. Um, it's basically like a first person investigative podcast, like a serial kind of a thing, except uh -huh. the mystery that we're going to uncover during this is a horrible uh, Lovecraftian, uh, terrible paranormal thing. And it's all fiction, but we kind of made it so it sounded like like serial or in the dark or one of those things where you've, you know, got got someone walking around with one of these and interviewing people. Um, and we actually recorded a lot of it on one of those. And uh, uh, it was it was a lot of fun. And we made that for Shutter, So it's on Shutter, but you can also get it for free anywhere you get podcasts. OK, great. Well, thank you, Ben. I really appreciate the time. Absolutely. Thank you for asking me. It's great to see you, Ray. Oh, have great. A, to it's been, it's been too long, man. Yeah. Listen, you take care. And you too. You have a happy holidays from the Santa Clarita International Film Festival. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great festival. OK, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.